All right. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Hi. Nice to see you all. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Katie McCarthy. Uh, I'm the head of adult audiences here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And Kate Marker would like to send her regrets that she cannot be here with you all tonight as she's on a trip for Hillwood this week. And she looks forward to joining you all for the next lecture. So as we begin, I'd like to take a moment to gratefully acknowledge the Nakach tank, also documented as the Anacostan, the Piscataway, and the Pamunkey. These are the native peoples on whose ancestral lands Hillwood stands, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their homes near us today. So we're so pleased to have audiences joining us for tonight's program right here in the theater and also from Zoom. For those of you in the theater, please make sure your devices are silenced. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can make yourself comfortable because your cameras and microphones are not active. Uh, you, for those of you on Zoom, you may also submit your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And of course, we'll have time for questions here in the theater as well. And we'll get to as many questions as we can from here in the theater and online at the end. So you may know tonight is the final lecture for our Glass Art Beauty Design Program series. If you haven't had a chance to visit the exhibition yet, I encourage you to come back very soon and bring your friends. It's over in the Adirondack building and in the exhibition, you will see highlights of Marjorie Merriweather Post's glass collection featuring a range of styles and techniques while placing those historic creations in dialogue with outstanding contemporary artworks. The show will be, view, be on view until January 14th. And you can learn more about these and Hillwood's many other rich offerings at our website, hillwoodmuseum.org. For those of you who are not yet a Hillwood member, I invite you to join today and make the most of your benefits this season and all year long. So as I mentioned, tonight is our final offering of programs surrounding the glass exhibition. We are joined tonight by our amazing chief curator and deputy director, Wilfried Zeisler, who is also the curator of this exhibition. In his presentation, he will take you all on an exploration of the stories behind the acquisition of the magnificent pieces in Marjorie Post's glass collection. And now, a little bit about Wilfried. So please note, when I read his bio, that some of these titles are originally written in French, and I'm saying the English translations because I did not want to torture you all with my French pronunciation. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wilfried Zeisler is Hillwood's Deputy Director and Chief Curator. He is a graduate of the Sorbonne University and the Ecole de Louvre in Paris. Wilfried has written extensively on French and Russian decorative arts, including several articles and contributions to books. Wilfried's dissertation, French Objects to Art and Luxury Goods in Russia, was published in Paris in 2014. Since 2009, he has participated in and curated exhibitions in Paris, Monaco, and Washington, DC. At Hillwood, his most recent exhibitions were Fabergé Rediscovered, Bauca de Vries, Worn Pieces, Natural Beauties, Ex Exquisite Works of Minerals and Gems, The Porcelain Flowers of Vladimir Konevsky, Determined Women, Collectors, Artists and Designers at Hillwood, and of course, Glass Art Beauty Design. Wilfred co-authored Konstantin Makovsky, The Tsar's Painter in America and Paris, as well as The Houses and Collections of Marjorie Merriweather Post, The Joy of It. He is the sole author of Half Fabergé Rediscovered, Living the Belle Epoque in Paris, Paul of Russia and Olga Paley, and The Yusupovs, One Century of French Collections. So now, please join me in welcoming Wilfried to the podium. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Katie, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, and I cannot believe this is a final uh, lecture of our lecture series. We had a wonderful series of presentation which introduced you to many of the artists we worked with for this um, exhibition. And uh, just as a reminder, um, you uh, have these wonderful works uh, currently on view in our uh, exhibition, works by Fred Wilson, 
um, Karen Lamont, um, Deborah Moore, Joyce J. Scott, Tim Tate, and Bess Lipman, who for most of them were subject of this wonderful lecture series. And if you are curious to learn about those, most of them are actually available online. And these contemporary artists were brought to this uh, exhibition to actually put Marjorie Post's collection and Hillwood Glass collection to a broader context of the history of glass making which is uh, definitely a technique which has been highly mastered for centuries um, by um, uh, artisans all over the world. Um, the um, collection and the exhibition also include, to reflect that um, long time uh, uh, mastery of glass techniques, also include ancient glass borrowed from local institutions such as the Virginia Museum of Fine Art and the Merton Oaks. But today, the idea behind this lecture is actually to explore, let's use a magnifying glass to explore further uh, the different stories behind some of the masterpieces in the uh, exhibition coming from Marjorie Post collection or Hillwood collection and how this whole collection came about here at Hillwood and how it was gathered by Marjorie Post. And I just wanted to add that all the glass pieces featured in this presentation are all on view uh, in the current exhibition. So if you miss them or don't remember them, you can always go back and look for them. So uh, the collection, um, the exhibition also, the reason why we did this exhibition was to focus on a lesser known aspect of Marjorie Post's interest in the decorative arts, which was glass despite the fact that we have actually about 1,600 pieces of glass in the collection, I will uh, assure you that not all of them are in the exhibition and we won't see all of them today. But uh, this exhibition, it's still actually a re uh, breaking record for Hillwood because we have over 300 pieces of glass on view in this exhibition. And also I won't show you 300 pieces today. Just a few, just to tell you about how this collection came about and uh, the new discovery that actually um, we are made during the preparation of this uh, project. So this magnifi magnificent magnifying glass, a work by Hermès from the 1960s, which is in the shape of an eye, which speaks to actually one of these properties of glass through the lens that helped explore you know, new technology through history, is a nice way to start this presentation to explore further our collection. So actually the collection reflects um, Marjorie Post's um, lifestyle in a way, and especially her being very well known as an, a, a, a hostess and who entertained a lot during her lifetime. And so many aspects uh, of the collection and of the glass collection is related to her love for setting table and arranging table. And one of the earliest piece related to this glassware collection coming from the Post family is this set, which is typical of the early 1900, is European, probably Italian. It has this very typical Guido H style made of this Rococo revival design, very uh, curved design with a lot of gilding and also an initial CW post for Marjorie Post's father, so the founder of the family business, Postum Cereal, later known as General Foods. And this set was probably commissioned by uh, CW Post while traveling throughout Europe in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But this set, which is uh, on view in the exhibition, came actually to, into the collection only in 75 after the passing of Marjorie Post, who died in 73. It was actually given by one of her daughters and actually many of the pieces you will see today came into the collection even though they belonged to the family later on once Hillwood became a museum after 77. So um, this is so one of these sort of early uh, in a way set from the Post family, but Marjorie Post commissioned her own sets uh, when she especially established her homes in New York in the 19, late 1910s, 1920s, and elsewhere. One of the set, which uh, is actually one of the highlights, you can see several of the pieces in the exhibition, but also uh, set on the breakfast room table. This is how it is set currently. Um, on the, our breakfast room table is a 1920s set made of black and white glass uh, in the Venetian style by Salviati. Salviati is still uh, product, uh, active today, was a very famous uh, glass works from Venice uh, Murano and speaks to this very old tradition of producing magnificent glass on the island of Murano, a tradition that began in the late 
um, at the end of the uh, Middle Age and the Renaissance period when glass works were founded and developed in Venice and which made the glass uh, from Venice particularly famous and because of the use of kilns and the risk of fire, actually the glass works historically installed in Venice, we have moved on islands and that's why they were settled uh, around Murano. And then from Italy in Murano, many of the glass works actually were um, the techniques moved uh, throughout Europe um, start progressively from the Renaissance through um, nowadays. But this set is a typical example of the revival of the traditional techniques of blown glass uh, in uh, Venice in Murano by Salviati from 1920s, but having this really modern twist by mixing the black and white colors. And that set was originally commissioned uh, from the New York apartments, um, the New York apartment of Marjorie Post in the 1920s, and it was actually commissioned to be set with the porcelain you can see set currently on the table, which is German and was also mainly black, white, and a gold, um, with a black and white and gold decoration. And um, this set, again, was actually a recent gift to the institution, so even though it came from Marjorie Post, it was um, uh, given by um, the estate of Dina Merrill, uh, Marjorie Poe's third daughter quite recently. And you can see how it fits perfectly in that setting with the beautiful Fred Wilson chandelier, which is a black uh, chandelier made also in Murano, also uh, speaking of this tradition of Venetian glass. But as we, you might know, Marjorie Post had many homes in the 1920s, so not only she commissioned sets for her New York apartment, but she also commissioned a few for her other homes, including Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach. And here you have another set which uh, she commissioned um, from Salviati in the 1920s as well. And this one is revisiting as well traditional techniques which made Venetian glass particularly famous, uh, colored glass and this uh, work of enamel, cold work enamel and painting and gilding to create this revival of uh, scenes inspired by Renaissance traditions um, on this wonderful set that she used to set on her famous Florence, so Italian inspired table, you can see it on the right, how it was set a, co set a couple of years ago for this set, which uh, also um, came to uh, the uh, collection from um, actually um, Dina Merrill in the 1970s. So again, coming from the family after Marjorie Postes. And actually Salviati, it's not a surprise that some of the early commission by Marjorie Post in the 1920s came from Salviati and Co. in Italy, because we know that her father, C.W. Post, ordered actually some works, especially plates and other um, um, works of art from Salviati himself in the early 20th century. So that relationship was quite long. And even in the 50s, Marjorie Post will commission from Salviati additional pieces, which we assume were broken to uh, complete her sets that she had previously commissioned. But of course, Venice and Italy is not the only country in Europe known, oh, I have always, when I have found some archival documentation, sorry, I forgot that, showcasing how the set was used here at Hillwood later on uh, by Marjorie Post from our archive. Sorry about that. But what I was going to say that Venice and Italy is not the only country uh, in Western Europe known for the development of uh, glass uh, production um, since the 1600s. And Bohemia, Central Europe, was also one of these locations still today known for the production of glass and many famous glass works. And in 1920s, actually in 29, especially Marjorie Post with her husband then E.F. Hutton will often travel to Europe and especially go to the resort of Karlsbad to in the Czech um, Republic. And there, because of the many tourists coming from all over the world, many local um, uh, luxury good industries or boutiques were open to actually sell objects or receive commission from these uh, foreigners visiting uh, the uh, resort of Carlsbad. And that's what Marjorie Post did. And there we know in 1929, she commissioned a series of sets, including uh, porcelain, but also glassware from the Ahachof uh, Glass Works, which is a company that still exists today, was founded in 1712 um, in the Czech Republic, and she commissioned this magnificent candelabra, which is uh, quite of a large uh, scale. It's about 25 inches high, 
Um, and it's uh, typical of what made Bohemian glass quite famous, like double layer crystal, so which is cut um, and so create that sort of relief design, colored glass, blue here, particularly typical. And this is a special commission for this very large candelabra, which is, has Marjorie Post monogram, MPH, because she was married by Hutt, with Hutton at that time. And don't get it wrong, this slide showcases two photos of the same candelabra. Actually, the female had two different finishes. So one was on the left in the shape of a sort of vase for flower arrangement, and one just as a spire on the right to finish the candelabra. So that two photos of the same piece with the two option, uh, depending on how you wanted to display it. In addition to this uh, custom-made uh, large candelabra that Marjorie Post commissioned from the Achach Glassworks in Achach of Bohemia, she also commissioned a whole set uh, of uh, same style um, uh, glassware, which was designed as described in the invoice a dark blue crystal cutting and monogram, which was based on a special order. 14 pieces of each glassware, which were originally meant to be used uh, in one of her uh, other homes, her first Hillwood at Long Island. Um, the only piece, I said that most of the objects you will see are in the exhibition. Yes, the candelabra is in the exhibition, but not the glassware. The glassware is actually still privately owned and was on loan to us for a special exhibition back in uh, 2018. And this is a photo taken of that setting uh, once we had those glassware um, on loan. And you can recognize the monogram, the same as on the candelabra. And also it was an homage, this setting, designed by one of my predecessors to actually uh, match this tradition that Marjorie Post loved when entertaining and setting table to have match colored, coordinated colored table. So you can see that through the arrangement of not only the glassware, but also the linen, also the porcelain and the flower arrangement. Who, who owns those? They are privately, uh, privately owned, so yes. We will keep the question for the end of the presentation. <laughs> so um, Marjorie Post was not only uh, ordering for herself. Uh, often she will also use this as an opportunity to order for family members. And here, for example, that same year, 1929, from the same company, Aha Glassworks, from the same situation being yeah, you know, an, in Carlsbad, she will order this set. Um, Again, uh, in the style of the 18th century with this beautiful enamel work representing hunting scenes. And this set she ordered actually for her eldest daughter Adelaide. And it was given to Hillwood actually by her in 1973 after the death of her mother. So, but Marjorie Post was not only commissioning from Western European uh, companies, she was also a supporting American company as we know. Um, glass was a very uh, important and developed industry here in the U.S. in the 1600s and known for its press glass. I will tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but also its cut glass. And in 1935, while commissioning her yacht, the famous Sea Cloud, she will actually order a full set, not only the glassware, but also candlesticks and different presentation pieces for the yacht, which was made with the uh, you know, uh, symbol of the Sea Cloud and also being very heavy in a way in the design so that it could stay in place while sailing on the ocean. And uh, here you can see samples of the glassware from the set commission from TJ Oaks and Company in Corning in 1935. And on the left, Marjorie Post and her daughter, Dina Merrill, actually lighting the, can lighting the candles uh, on board the Sea Cloud in 38. And the commission of Marjorie Post was not limited to, you know, her love of entertaining by ordering many glasswares, but she was also furnishing many homes, as you understood um, until now. And so some of the, oh, I always forget one slide. Sorry about that. So before that, an additional glassware, uh, that one she commissioned in 38-39 uh, while in Brussels as the wife of the uh, ambassador, first Joe Davis, first um, in Moscow and then in Brussels. And then through her interior designer she was working with there, she ordered from Val Saint Lambert, which is a company still uh, active today in Belgium, that wonderful set, crystal cut, 
with the uh, coat of arm of the Davises, so um, when she was married to him, and she would order it at the same time as this plates made in France, in Limoges, with the American eagle, because uh, it was a set that she would use as a wife of the uh, American ambassador to Belgium. And so what I was going to say about her commissions, she was not limited to glassware, but also she was furnishing many homes. So we talk about her New York apartment, we talked about Mar-a-Lago, we talked about Long Island, um, Hillwood, Long Island. We talked about the yacht, we talked about the embassy, and here we have very large scale uh, candelabras. So these are about 60 uh, inches high. Uh, it's a pair of candelabras that we don't know exactly when she commissioned. They are first documented in 1935, and I will show you when they were first documented. But these are pieces which are one of the reasons why we did this exhibition. They were uh, in storage for decades when I started here, and I knew and, uh, that they were by the famous French glassworks Baccarat, which is, again, a company that still exists today, was created in 1764, was known in the 19th century for creating these large-scale pieces of um, furniture, uh, candelabras, chandeliers, to showcase their know-how uh, at fairs or international um, exhibitions. And in 1867, they had displayed actually large-scale candelabras, which according to the tradition in the company were in 1867 shown at the World Fair in Paris. And during an official visit of Emperor of Russia, Alexander II, he bought a series of candelabra, which we don't know where they went. They have never been found, never on any proof have been found, but since then the company has called this model the Candelabra of the Tsarina. And uh, this model, so first shown in 1867, was produced, uh, they are quite rare, but was produced until the 20th century. Uh, the newest one were electrified actually, and it was, they were produced in three different models, three different uh, scales. You can see from the archives of Baccarat on the right, the three scales, three sides. So 12 light, um, 18 and 24, and we have the smallest one, which is on the right, with 12 light. And uh, these uh, pair of candelabras, while we were preparing for this exhibition, were deassembled, conserved, clean, and we actually found the mark of the company of Baccarat. And uh, here you can see how they were used. First time on the left, in the 1935 from our archive, this is how they were set for Marjorie Post's wedding to Joe Davis in New York, in her New York apartment in 35. And then on the right, that's how they were used uh, in the dining room uh, at the American Embassy in Brussels. This picture dates to 38, 39. And that brings us to uh, another piece of furniture from France that she acquired around that same period. Uh, while in Europe, she will travel around and she will go to Paris. And in 1937, in Paris, you had this really important exhibition, the International Exhibition of 1937, where uh, many countries were invited to display their latest creations. And um, one of the displays by France and by a company, we still exist, Saint-Gobain, was actually to showcase uh, the new design using glass um, in a very modern style, the Art Deco style. And that uh, whole display was designed by an architect named, uh, named René Coulon, and he designed a series of glass furniture for Saint-Gobain. Saint-Gobain is a very historic and famous company had always explored uh, actually the use in, uh, of glass in new technologies and actually they became first famous in the 1600s when they developed new technology to create large scale mirrors which made the whole of mirrors of Versailles so famous afterwards. And in the early 20th century, they were exploring new ways of using glass, collaborating with designers. And here on the right, one of the pieces they showed at this exhibition in 1937 were a series of actually heater and towel warmers. And here is one that Marjorie Post may have seen at this exhibition because we know that right after that, she had several in her uh, quarters in the American Embassy on the right, a pictures from 38, 39, and on the, um, on the left, sorry, and on the right, that's where usually that heater uh, leaves uh, at Hillwood in Marjorie Post's bathroom. And so we are now in the 30s, and Marjorie Post also 
going to Russia in starting in 37, will actually discover Russian art and Russian imperial culture. And of course, with that, the production of glass in Russia uh, since um, the uh, 1600, but also the love of Russia for European culture and European decorative arts and French decorative arts. And so most likely, not sure, but it's the first time it's documented, she may have acquired in those state-run shops organized by the Soviet government in Moscow and elsewhere in the Soviet Union where she could acquire many artworks which had been um, confiscated during the Russian Revolution and preserve them in her own collection. So she may have found this actual piece on the left which is uh, quite impressive. It's again a piece attributed to Bakara which is most, li most likely not genuine. The top was most likely changed or rearranged um, after its production, it may have been actually a fountain or a small table produced by Bakara as they did in the second half of the 19th century, maybe for the Russian market, and that's maybe where she found it because this is where she used it for the first time. Here on the right, one of her first uh, actually table setting in Russia in March 1937, and she used that piece, it gives you the scale, as a centerpiece set with flowers. And she even described in her own word in the scrapbook, table entirely set in crystal with a very high vase, yes, filled with yellow roses. And she definitely loved and developed an interest for crystals in Russia because uh, one of the recommendations that uh, uh, the president um, the, and the State Department made uh, for their diplomats in Russia, because crystal was highly appreciated in Russia, was to set tables only with crystal. And really, Marjorie Post took that uh, recommendation very seriously, as shown by all these photos from the table that she set at Spaso House, the residence of the American ambassador in Moscow. And as she said in her own scrapbook here, the president asked when we when we first went to Russia to use only crystal, and that's what she did. And here you can see how she traveled with her Baccarat candelabra. Remember, 35, they were in her New York apartment. Here they are on this table in Moscow, and they went after that to Brussels. And also additional crystal, like this vase here in the center of that setting for her farewell party, 1938. You can see again those Baccarat candelabra and that vase in the center, which we assume first time documented here, was acquired most likely in the state-run antique shops in Moscow and used by Marjorie Post immediately. Later on, she actually gave it to her daughter, Eleanor, and then she gave it to Hillwood. So you can see all this stories of the object moved a lot around you know, family members and around many countries. And so as I was saying, so while she was developing her interest in the Russian imperial culture, uh, buying antiques in um, Russia, she would acquire some of her future treasures of the Russian imperial collection. Among them is this magnificent face, which she most likely found uh, in Russia, is first time documented, set on this table at the American embassy in 1938-1939. It's a very rare piece which showcases a high mastery of glass engraving in the early 20th century. It's a piece from about 1912 produced at the Imperial Glass Works uh, in St. Petersburg. And it's very rare. We only know two pieces and both are at Hillwood. But as you can see on this picture, she had only one in the late 30s. And actually in 1970, uh, Marvin Ross, her curator she hired in 1958 while she developed Hillwood, found in New York at an antique dealer another vase exactly the same. And she said, would you like to have a pair? And she said, sure. And here it is, the second vase she found, and then they used it, believe it or not, as umbrella stands uh, <laughs> in the entrance of the mansion. This is not how they are displayed anymore, uh, but that's how it was set uh, in, um, right after the acquisition of the second one in 1970. And she will even be interested in some specific, you know, decorative features that were highly appreciated in Russia. Uh, the use of Vera Aglo Mise, which is actually this sheet of glass which are painted on the reverse or gilded on the reverse, which were inlaid on pieces on furniture. 
and she actually bought in Russia this impressive desk, which is in the exhibition. Sometimes when you enter the exhibition, you wonder why this piece is on view, because you see mostly the mahogany, the wood, but then you discover these wonderful uh, sheets of glass in Ver Eglo Musee, which were highly appreciated and mastered by Russian artisans, and this one dates to the early, uh, around 1800. And um, she um, had it, um, bought it in Russia. It was actually used by Gina Merrill in her suite at the American Embassy, as you can see it on the right, and uh, was later actually given to Hillwood in 1980 by Gina Merrill herself. So again, a piece that travels a little uh, between family members <coughs> and showcasing like the broad use of glass and of course the broad interest of Marjorie Post. Of course, being like uh, fast, having already a large collection of glassware, Marjorie Post began to collect also glassware, or gla tableware made of glass in Russia. For some pieces we have, we don't know exactly when they were acquired, so we don't know if they actually were bought in Russia. But this is a piece of one of the earlier set, as we call a set, made in uh, Russia in the 18th century. It's a piece which is currently on view. We have only one piece of that set. Originally, it had about 240 pieces when it was commissioned in the 1740s by Empress Elizabeth of Russia from the uh, St. Petersburg Glass Works and was used actually at court. Uh, it is mentioned engraved on the foot of the glass. You have an inscription in Russian saying for the court, so meaning it was a set used for the court. And those glasses are very typical. You will see other of how they were engraved in the 18th century in Europe and also especially in Russia with a symbol of the ruling uh, empress. So you have the monogram EP for Elizabeth, Elizabeth Petrovna uh, the first, and then the double eated eagle. Sometime even you will see later there is also a profile of the ruling uh, of the ruler on these um, uh, glasses. And she also bought full sets or like part of sets that had been um, you know sold by the Soviets through uh, antique shops. And this one she actually found in London from uh, a dealer who. Uh, was and he still exists today, specialized in Fabergé and works of art, and she bought that set produced in the first half of the 19th century at the Imperial Glass Factory. It's called the Cottage Set Service, which was made for actually a cottage, a little uh, country house uh, built by Nikolai I on uh, the uh, near Petersburg and the countryside on the Gulf of Finland uh, in Peterhof, it's called Leistet, it's called Alexandria, and he built a cottage in a Gothic style. It's typical of the 1820s re Gothic revival, and for that cottage, he commissioned for his wife a full set, which was also in a way in that Gothic medieval revival as shown by this coat of arm, which was designed especially for this residence and with this symbol and this motto, which means for face, emperor, and fatherland, which was inspired by Zhukovsky, who was a philosopher of the period. And again, for this set, which is still in large, um, for most part, conserved at uh, Peterhof today, uh, actually the china, the porcelain, was also produced with the same coat of arm. And Marjorie Post at the same time was buying enough to set tables with glasses and tables with the porcelain as well. And we still have them in the collection. Um, and then, of course, having developed this interest for uh, Russian imperial culture, moving back to the U.S. and having this vision with Hillwood of creating a museum, she will continue to acquire works of art, including glass. Here, for example, another set, which is quite interesting, um, and which is, again, produced by the Imperial Glass Manufactory was produced, the design was created first in the 1820s, but was actually uh, continued, continually produced until the early 20th century and has technically a very nice feature, which is this monogram you see on each pieces, which is uh, inserted in a way made of enamel in the glass structure, which is quite fascinating and was quite popular. Actually, it was a technique developed in the first half of the 19th century and was quite popular all over Europe. And you can see, if you pay attention, this set is all the pieces are from the same design and they all have monogram. If you don't pay attention, you can imagine it's from one set, but actually if you look at the monogram, they are all different. We have one, two, three, four, five different monograms on all of the pieces of the same set. It's because they, be, they, became, they came from different owners. Because 
because this was a model called the banquet service, which was made for each member or many members of, of the imperial family when they got their palaces, they had to furnish it, and everyone had a set or several sets which were used for every day or for formal gatherings. And uh, they were just distinguished by the monogram. And after the revolution, when all those sets were separated and sold, dealers will really need them, them without taking at pay attention to the monogram to have enough pieces to have a whole set, but they came actually from different sets, which is, I think, quite amusing. But still, she had enough uh, to uh, set tables if necessary, and she bought them almost as a whole uh, in 1955 from a dealer in New York specialized in uh, Russian works of art, still active today. And um, she also afterwards added a few pieces uh, to that set to recreate it like more completely. And also furnishing, you know, uh, Hillwood, she was also looking for, uh, you know, pieces to adorn, you know, the house and if possible, antiques from Russia. And so um, this uh, chandelier, the famous breakfast room chandelier is a beautiful example of uh, the glass production in Russia in the late 18th century, the love for chandelier and lighting fixture for mixing gold colored, uh, colored glass with a contrast of the gilt bronze. And that uh, chandelier she bought actually through, uh, through her interior designer, Eleanor Macmillan in 1957 for the breakfast room. Uh, actually, there were several chandeliers hanging there and options until she found the one she wanted. And it was discovered afterwards that this chandelier came from uh, the state bedroom of one of the palaces in the uh, outskirts of uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Tsarskaya Selo, the Catherine Palace. And you can see on these photos from 1928, uh, our chandelier hanging in this room. But um, it doesn't mean that this chandelier came actually historically from that room. We know that these rooms were completely refurnished starting in 1919 after the Russian Revolution, when actually curators transforming those palaces into museums based on old inventories, based on um, old watercolors and representation of those interiors, removed everything which was from the 19th century and tried using pieces from storerooms, from storages to recreate the atmosphere of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And that chandelier most likely was installed during that period, came from Tsarskaya, so most likely, but installed in 19, around 1919 when it opened as a museum and then was selected to be the accession and then uh, came to uh, our collection. And so with this vision that Marjorie Post had for Hillwood and for opening a museum, um, and oh, I always forget a slide, did you notice? So this is uh, actually uh, just to show how she must have been thrilled to learn about this story and this potential provenance from Tsarsky Eselo because she herself visited Tsarsky Eselo and the same palace in 1937, 1938, and here you can see her handwriting commenting all of the rooms she saw while visiting those palaces. And just as a reminder, she saw them before they were destroyed and bombed during the Second World War. So she saw them in their all, all, all really glory. And so having now this vision for Hillwood and knowing that she would one day create like a museum for future generation to enjoy, she would develop and continue to acquire uh, works of art related to her interests, including in glass. But for glass, what's quite interesting, she has starting in the 60s, acquired several ensembles, several collection from pri pri previous collectors, all as groupings. So for example, and many people who actually were as she was in Russia in the first half of the 20th century, so able to have access to those state-run antique shops and to acquire this object which were sold by the Soviet government. So for example, in 1966, so three collections, especially regarding glass, she bought the glass collection, the Russian glass collection of Albertina Reli. Albertina Reli was the wife of Guido Reli, who in the late 30s was a secretary at the Italian embassy in Moscow. And while there, they actually gathered this wonderful collection of glassware, and she bought the entire collection in 1966, mm -hmm. about 127 pieces of glass from that Relic collection, and among them, that whole set, another set from the imperial tables, uh, which was a set which was called the country um, set, which was countryside 
uh, residences set, which was made actually to be used in the countryside of the imperial residences. And again, a model which was created in the 1820s of um, cut uh, crystal and which we have a certain amount of pieces which allowed Marjorie Post if she wanted to use them and set them on tables. And from the Rally collection, just a few additional pieces. We show the diversity and evolution of production of glassware in Russia in the 19th century, development of new techniques such as um, transfer printing in the center, which is very cute decanter uh, showcasing, you know, those um, uh, cars, like playing cars, like with the gambling scene on the left, this very naturalistic inspired, you know, the, not only the flowers on the, uh, uh, on the bottle itself on the left, but also the shape. I love the shape of the uh, top, which looks like a fountain of water. And then on the right, um, the green color of the glass, but also the gilding, which actually is not gilding, is actually silver, which is also uh, this sort of like in the 19th century love for different colors and a research in decoration in glass, which was also mastered uh, by the Imperial Glass Works, but also by various private glass works um, founded in Russia in, since the 18th century. And then another collection we know about is the Rosso collection, which uh, was, not was not purchased by Marjorie Post, but given to Hillwood for Marjorie, for, to Marjorie Post for Hillwood by uh, Mrs. Rosso, Frances Rosso, who was married actually to Augusto Rosso. Augusto Rosso was the Italian ambassador in Soviet Russia at the same time when Joe Davis and Marjorie Post were in Moscow in the, late, in the late 30s. And here you can see actually the two couples. So Marjorie Post and Joe Davis and Frances and Augusto Rosso um, having apparently fun uh, and, uh, <laughs> at the American um, uh, embassy uh, in Moscow. And so while the Davises were actually sort of collecting and visiting all these shops and preserving, buying all these artworks, the Rossos were doing the same. And knowing that Marjorie Post would create a museum here in 1968, Frances Rosso decided to give her uh, the family collection, which was built at the same time and was very similar um, that the, in terms of type of objects that the collection that Marjorie Post had built. So she decided to give that collection to Hillwood. And so uh, the whole collection, the Rosso collection is here now. It's about almost 500 objects. But among, among these 500 objects, 59 pieces of glass. And those pieces include this uh, very beautiful goblet with lead, which is one of these typical presentation piece from the 18th century from the St. Petersburg glass works with this monogram again, as I mentioned uh, earlier on. And this one again has a monogram of Empress Elizabeth. And then also larger scale pieces such as this candelabra on the left, a very nice candelabra from a pear, which is typical of the late 18th century glass in Russia or in design actually, and in taste very similar to the chandelier I just mentioned, the love for colored glass, here it's blue, and all this crystal and the contrast with the gilt bronze, gilt metal. And on the right, we are like now in the first half of the 19th century, cut crystal with gilt bronze, again, candelabra from a pear, uh, given by the Rosso. And then finally, in 1970, I'm just checking now, just in case I forgot to slide again, <laughs> but uh, finally, in 1970, uh, Marjorie Post was able to acquire 51 pieces from one collection, the collection of Alexandre and Bert Popov. The Popov were actually born in Imperial Russia. They moved to France after the Russian Revolution. As actually many Russians, they opened actually an antique shop which specialized in Russian works of art, but also porcelain. Marjorie Post, of course, was a client of Popov, which was established in Paris since 1920 on the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré. And um, at one point uh, later in her career, Madame Popov decided to sell her entire gloss collection. Marvin Ross and Marjorie Post knew about the collection. They were all excited about it. There was a lot of negotiation and they finally acquired the entire collection, 51 pieces of glass to be added to Hillwood's collection. And, um, and actually, Madame Popov was really thrilled to know that her collection will end up here because it was a way to preserve this culture and history, uh, knowing that Hillwood would become a museum 
one day. And the collection includes a variety of pieces, some with actually imperial provenance, and on the left, one of our earliest pieces uh, piece related to uh, glass making in Russia. The goblet on the left with this um, double-headed eagle was produced in the late 1600, most likely a piece which uh, expressed the, um, in the presence of artisans from Bohemia, uh, where actually glassmaking was particularly highly mastered uh, since the 1600, and so who were invited by the Russian rulers to come and develop the industry uh, of glassmaking in Russia, and so be it created in Bohemia for the Russian market or created in Russia by Bohemian artisans that we don't know for sure, but definitely an early creation of, that, um, of the glasses uh, in Russia. And then on the right, another of this impressive goblet with a beautiful detail of here a profile, an engraved profile from the 18th century and this time of Empress Catherine II. And then in the center from that collection especially came a series of 19th century, early 19th century pieces which were all commemorating the victory of the Russian army against Napoleon, Alexander I against Napoleon in 1814. And often the monogram, the motto, the inscription commemorates the entrance of the Russian army in Paris in 1814. And here are actually additional pieces uh, with the same theme. On the left, with similar inscription, you can see the monogram of A uh, with the one which is Alexander I, so who was victorious against Napoleon. And then on the right, another champagne uh, glass here from that same collection, the Puff Puff collection, and with monograms, inscriptions, which actually are often present on glassware because these are like the events that you want to celebrate by a toast, uh, you know, um, which uh, connects the shape and the use with actually the commemoration written or inscribed in different ways on those pieces. And so that made actually Marjorie Post's collection early on, 50s, 60s, 70s, quite unique regarding Russian glass. And so that intrigued actually more and more creators and specialists in glass. And a relationship began between actually the Corning Glass Museum and a Marjorie Post curator, Marvin Ross. And um, actually there were many exchanges, um, research um, between both institutions were done. And according, after a visit of Marvin Ross uh, to uh, the um, Corning Glass Museum to see what they had regarding Russian glass, she, he came back and said to Marjorie Post that according to the director of the Corning Glass Museum, no one will be able to surpass your Russian glass collection. So that's what was said. Um, and um, Marvin Ross, uh, who had actually published a few years prior to that quote in 1970, he had published in the 60s actually the first books related to Marjorie Post collection. He had published uh, the book, uh, which was actually the first publication in the Western, um, in the West about you know Russian porcelain, which was based on Marjorie Post collection, about Fabergé and her silver collection. And he was hoping that she would uh, let him publish her glass collection, uh, but uh, she was, not, she didn't decide. She did. She decided not to move forward with that. So we had only to wait until 2001 to have a first publication only on the Russian glass collection, and today to have a full uh, exhibition dedicated to her glass because it's not only Russian glass as we have seen. It's you know a lot of European glass, but also American glass, which is something which is a lesser known aspect of this lesser known aspect of her collecting. She had a great interest for this really uh, industry here in the U.S., and she particularly loved uh, press glass, which um, glass product glass, which for which uh, American glass is particularly well known. Models and techniques which were inspired by French uh, production very often, and as her daughter stated in 1975, Marjorie Post loved and collected for many years those objects. So this is really also one of her interests was, um, as an American, her interest for this, you know, decorative arts. And also, uh, as you may um, know, when she received a gift from the Soviet government in 1938, when she left uh, Soviet Russia, uh, pieces of porcelain from uh, selected from a museum, the Museum of Ceramics in Moscow, she in exchange gave a series of pieces of glass and American porcelain, American glass and porcelain, which are still uh, in this collection today. 
So since then, uh, the collection and the glass collection has still um, developed a little bit. And so the museum has continued to acquire major pieces related to our glass collection. And I just wanted to show you a few little samples. One is this amazing piece, which was bought in 2003 uh, by the museum, which is from the Bakhmetev Glass Works, which is one of these private glass works in Russia from the 19th century. This piece dates to 1815 and was created by Alexander Vershinin, who was a workmaster, a surf artisan who was working at the glass works and who was known for creating these amazing tumblers, which are two layers of glass in between which you have this amazing scenes, uh, decorated um, uh, little scenes made of different moss, paper, straw, wood, lichen, and so on. Uh, amazing details and most likely special commission to commemorate a special event, most likely an engagement or a marriage as suggested by the presence of mono crown monogram on the back, you can see on the right, so it's monogram. So again, a piece to celebrate and commemorate a specific event. And there are only a dozen of those pieces known in the world, and one is here. One year later, in 2004, my predecessor were able to acquire this amazing table. Again, another example of the wonderful technique of Verreglomise, this painting on glass on the reverse which was inlaid, uh, this sheet of glass inlaid on these pieces of furniture, particularly appreciated in Russia in the late 18th century, early 19th century. This dates to about 1800 and was bought uh, from auction by the museum coming from the famous Agnelli collection, the famous Italian entrepreneurs. And finally, while in 2008, uh, the museum acquired in Germany on the right, the series of six plates, which speaks to the love of color in the 19th century uh, in um, crystal. And here you have uh, plates which came dates, dating around the 18, from the 1840s, which came from a set, most likely day, made for one of the children of, uh, one of the daughters of Emperor Nikolai I of Russia. And while we were preparing for this exhibition, we had the opportunity of getting as a long-term loan that piece on the left, which is on view, like it came in a few months before the opening. It's a long-term loan, so you will see it for a certain amount of time. It's a piece of the same set, um, which has silver mount, and which will be very soon uh, after the, it's on view in the exhibition, but will be very soon set with that, uh, with these plates on the breakfast room table um, very soon. So um, I hope um, that um, this gave you a little insight of you know, the stories behind all of the wonderful objects uh, we have in the show and how Marjorie Post built this and her family built this uh, amazing collection here at Hillwood dedicated to glass. Thank you very much and I will be happy to take a few questions. So if you have questions, please wait for the mic so that the audience on Zoom can also um, hear uh, the questions. And then we will most likely have also Zoom questions. Yes. Uh, after you discovered the Baccarat candelabra, yes. what else has surprised you the most about looking at the collection of glass, which Mrs. Post was not really known for particularly as you delved into the basement and wherever? Well, I mean, discovered the back of the lab, I mean, we knew they were there. Uh, they were stored, they were protected by, you know, clothes to, from the dust and so on. And, you know, when you start in a new position, you explore, you know, the collection and you want to learn more. I mean, they were not attributed to Baccarat. They were only documented in a very small black and white image. So I was like intrigued by this piece. And when the first time I saw them, I was like, oh my God, this is Baccarat. And it's only now that we know for sure it is because of the signature we found. I mean, that was really the, the one of the main, um, I will say, discovery, uh, those large pieces. And I will say the second one is actually that blue candelabra um, from the Ahar Glassworks because this was always stored, I had seen it, but like in pieces, it was not assembled together. And so I didn't know how it looked like all together. And so that was a discovery. And what was even more interesting was 
when working on the, the book on Marjorie Post, the joy of it, and working on that book on the, um, the collection of Marjorie Post, I actually found the uh, original um, invoices from the Achach Glassworks because we didn't know who made that candelabra, and so it was describing the invoices, and so then it was describing also sets, so that was I was then able to identify and attribute all the uh, other pieces that we still have that you commissioned from Ahachov and same from Salviati from the invoices we were able to attribute actually more pieces. So it's really some of the, um, I will say glassware and because you know, the curators were mo main, makes sense, we're, we're focusing on the Russian collection and so a large part of the collection because of the 2001 publication was quite well known even though there have been some new discoveries made, but like regarding, you know, the glassware, like the sets coming from the family, also because they were given, you know, some of them in only in the 70s or 80s or more recently, so you had some discovery to be made, so that's what I, yeah. Oh, the mic, the mic, sorry, yeah. This relates to how you decided to display the glass, which we saw in the Adirondack building. We loved the way it was lit from below and a, a little bit less, but from above. Uh, I'm wondering, was there any question in your mind as to how to do that? Is, it, is there a standard or did you decide a fair number of things? This is a very good question. And actually what's good about glass, because you know, in the museum world, depending on the material, you cannot, you know, you have limited on the, uh, on the amount of light you can put on an object, especially when it's textile or watercolor and so on. So, but for glass, it's kind of fine. So you can have, you know, you can lit them a little bit more than um, you usually do, but uh, definitely because of the transparency of glass, because of glass and the reflective reflection of glass. So first thing when uh, we met with our designer was like really, okay, lighting will be a big, big thing to think about and to discuss. Uh, so um, the backlit, uh, yes, I mean, it was a conversation based on other displays I had seen. Uh, in other institutions specializing glass, how they will display, you know, the glasses and so on. So for some, for this project, you know, the, the theme and the way how the objects are presented is uh, always a conversation between the curator and, and the designer. I'm going to jump in really quick with a question from Zoom. Um, someone would like to know, in relation to some of your earlier slides, um, if Marjorie Merriweather Post ever broke any of the pieces of her <laughs> glass sets, um, would they contact the glass makers to make replacements? Since most of them are custom, what would happen? So that's a very good question, and I would assume, as I uh, you know, alluded to during the presentation, that some might have been broken because we know from, and actually that's how we were able sometimes to attribute some of these sets because she ordered additional pieces later on to the same company, but we didn't have the earlier uh, invoice, but they are referring to the previous commission, and so that was helping, you know, um, attributing some of these sets. So I will assume it was, uh, yes, yeah, so they are like uh, example of her commissioning additional pieces to add on or to, but it's never said if it was broken or not. So, but yes, it's usually how it is done for these sort of high hand glass works and it's still the same today. So for this custom made uh, production, um, they keep always one or two sample uh, in their collection, the glass works, and then if the clients wants, you know, to reorder or redo it, I mean, that's how it was done, and so then you can refer to it, and there is a drawing, or there is a model that you had to approve that you will use to redo them, and that's how actually many of these glass works, which often today, when they are still active, they often today have, um, they often today have actually, um, a museum attached to the company and it's often the, the core of the collection was often created because of all these samples they kept to keep track of what they were producing and being able to reproduce them uh, you know in case uh, clients were asking for that sorry I think that answered the question. so I have a question I know you're talking about um, Hillwood's glass collection but I am curious about um, how you got to the contemporary um, 
glass artists for the show and how you, how that process worked, I guess. Yeah, so one of our uh, you know, goals is really to have uh, and demonstrate that our collection is relevant to uh, you know, today's creation, today's design world, and today's audience. And so we always try to include uh, you know, contemporary creation within our collection, especially in the, without our, within our exhibition, especially when we have an exhibition focusing on a specific material or, or medium. And regarding glass, we had some, uh, having, them, having that in mind, um, we had a few artists which we knew for a few years already that you know we would be potentially interested because they would make perfect sense and so on. Um, and um, so those were first on the list, I will say, when we started brainstorming about that glass show uh, to put you know the uh, exhibition into context. And then once that was done, we would uh, definitely, you know, research further and, and, you know, talk, you know, speak around and look around and, you know, and try to find, you know, which works will be the most, um, uh, the best selection in a way so that the, their work will create a real dialogue with our pieces. And for example, I can only, I mean, I don't know, like Deborah Moore's Orchid, do I need to explain why it makes perfect sense here? Uh, Fred Wilson chandeliers <coughs> with our chandelier collection uh, and so on. So uh, Joyce J. Scott, um, you know, uh, beadwork and our bead pieces and all of that. So that's how it works. So we usually have a few uh, names in mind and then we just do research and try to find, uh, you know, the, you know, the most, the, the m uh, most relevant piece. Any other question from Zoom, maybe? We do have one other question. Um, someone would like to know if, it, again, in reference to uh, Marjorie Post Glass collection, back when she was using these pieces, did she have specialists uh, come in to handle and clean all of her glassware? So I don't know. I mean, so yes, when she was using her um, sets, um, as far as I know, um, and she would have extra staff, for example, for big parties. It's uh, usually we know that she would only her staff who was trained uh, to handle her uh, pieces would actually handle them. So I will call that specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Qu yes, there is one more question I see here. just interested in the Russian glass because historically a lot of foreign artisans went to Russia at various points. Uh, is, was there any particular country that you found in terms of Mrs. Post collection who ended up in, in Russia? I mean, Czech Spins, whoever, you know, might have been there. Was there anything in the production of the Russian oh. industry from a particular well, it depends, I will say, from what we are talking about, but I will say for the beginning of the um, um, glass industry, for example, in Russia, um, uh, it's known that it was uh, a lot of uh, Bohemian artisans from Bohemia where glass uh, works had been flourishing for uh, decades when Peter the Great began to have this interest of bringing in, you know, and developing the Russian industry. So some of the Bohemian uh, artisans were invited to come in to work um, and develop this industry in Russia. And then afterwards, depending, but depending on the periods, but you will often find um, in different industries, you know, artisans coming from different countries, from Europe and so on. So they were, some of them were um, traveling a lot, so it really depends. But I will say for the beginning of the industry, really, there was an influence from Bohemia. All right, any more questions? All right, so thank you very much. <laughs>